We're with uh, Professor Holly Mickelson in Monterey. Uh, Professor Mickelson, just tell me first what you do at Monterey and what you do professionally at the moment. I teach court interpreting here, introduction to court interpreting, and normally in the second set of classes, consecutive court interpreting testimony. Mm -hmm. And I am a court interpreter myself, and I mainly these days I don't interpret in court per se. I don't do judicial proceedings. I do extrajudicial proceedings, uh, depositions, and administrative hearings mainly. And I am a freelance translator also. Recently I have taught translation here. I've taught just about every course in the mm -hmm. curriculum over the years, but um, right now I'm not teaching translation. And I really love translating myself, so I do probably more of that than interpreting these days. Okay, so you're a pr practitioner teacher? Yes. Basically, but you've also published Yes, um, I, most of my publications are practical manuals. Mm -hmm. I got interested in developing materials for court interpreters because there was nothing out there. Yeah. And so I have done a lot of manuals and I've written about court interpreting extensively. Um, we are revising a textbook that was written a good 20 years ago now, um, Fundamentals of Court Interpretation. Mm -hmm. So in the last couple of months, I've been working feverishly on getting that up to date. And 20 years is a long time. It's a lot of a lot has happened. I might add that that uh, you wrote a book for a series that I was editor yes, of. Yes, yes. That's the only book I've ever edited where I didn't have to change one word. I, so I was a little very, surprised very that it came back with nothing. <laughs> nothing to change. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> I'm glad. The only one ever. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's go back now to when you were 22, 23, somewhere around there. What were you doing at that time? What did you want to be as well? Oh, I was here studying. Okay. I yeah. came here as a student in 1974 when you I was... You're American though? You're yes, from, yes. I, from I'm from Oregon in California, okay. West Coast. Um, I have not led a very adventurous life, actually. Um, I came here right out of college and thought I was fluent enough to be a translator interpreter, got a very rude awakening here. In, in Spanish In English. Spanish and English. I had French passively, but I quickly abandoned that. I knew that I needed to work on my Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I just did two languages, translation and interpretation. And when I graduated, the work that was here locally was court interpreting. And I realized that I hadn't been trained for that and no one had been. It was a brand new profession then. They hadn't done any certification exams yet. Um, so fortunately for me, I don't know if it was so fortunate for the defendants that I interpreted for, um, I was able to learn on the job and I didn't take a certification exam for another couple of years. Did, did the exams exist? At no, they didn't forever. exist. Um, I took the very first federal court interpreter certification exam and the very first California state court interpreter certification exam. And um, I, so I developed materials while I was preparing myself for those and continued developing materials to help people. Unfortunately, court interpreting is not a profession that has a recognized course of study that everyone takes to qualify for exams. Many, many people are self-taught and they're left to prepare on their own for certification exams that are very demanding and they don't have any guidance really. In, in the United States these exams are state exams? They them. usually are given by the state court system and by the federal court system. Okay. But there's not one certification system for the entire country? No, we have a dual judicial system, federal and state. Mm -hmm. And so those two are separate. Each state has its own court system and its own rules and um, the vocabulary changes, court proceedings mm -hmm. change quite a bit from one state to another. Has the profession changed a lot in the period you've been associated with, particularly with respect yes. to training and certification? Yes, very, very much. Now there are degree programs mm -hmm. 
in interpreting. They tend to be more certificate programs how, than how many degree. Would that be? Well, there are dozens. It's hard to mm. keep track of them okay. all because they pop up like mushrooms, but they're mostly certificate programs in community colleges or they are minors in undergraduate you degrees. Know, outside of the United States, what's happening with the mm. profession? It is growing similarly. I mm. think it tends to be an adjunct to other interpreter training programs. They have recognized now that it is a legitimate branch of the profession and in some countries it is more and more um, regulated and so the universities are attempting to prepare students for the requirements they have to meet. Um, okay. But many countries still don't have any oversight of court interpreters or any standards in place at all. Okay. How about the professionalization process? Uh, are, they, are interpreters paid more these days than they used to be? Yes, they are, but we, are, we work for government agencies and they are not funded very well. And um, so we haven't had a raise in many years. Okay. Uh, okay. So it, in the beginning it was very limited. Um, but ironically, in some courts they paid quite a bit for interpreters because it was a rare occurrence mm -hmm. and it, they didn't have to really budget for it it was just a every once in a while they would need an interpreter and they would pay for one of them like an expert witness but now almost all state court systems have a line item budget for court interpreting and they are really trying to control that okay. so we've faced much more pressure than we used to interpreters work freelance basically or the most of them do. There are staff positions. Yeah. Um, the federal d U.S. district courts have staff positions for Spanish interpreters. Um, and it, that's almost always the case, that if they have a staff position, it's for a Spanish interpreter. Um, and in Los Angeles, they need hundreds of interpreters every day. And they have so many different languages that are required some of those interpreters are now employees because of the number of days they work per year so they're entitled to benefits and so on but um, many of them especially in the languages of limited diffusion don't have any uh, job stability at all. I'm very interested in the relation between practice and research and I'm wondering if in this field there is much research being done and if it's useful in any way? Yes, it is. Um, the, probably the first research project was uh, Susan Burke Seligson's study of uh, the use of language in the courtroom by interpreters and the impact that that had on jurors who were hearing evidence through an, an interpreter. That was really groundbreaking. Since then, she, she found that it does have an impact. Yes, she, she did, that. and and it was a limited study, and she had to use simulated juries because it she yeah. couldn't do it with actual live jurors, um, and that's one of the limitations that we always face in trying to do research. Um, court proceedings are not something that uh, lend themselves to people just coming in and experimenting with things. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I would really like to see is research on the experience of the limited English proficient users of the interpreting services. There are questionnaires of judges and attorneys about their attitude. Sandra Hale has done that in, in Australia. Um, and conference interpreters have done a similar thing, questionnaires of delegates about their experience working with interpreters. But no one has ever questioned the speakers of minority languages. These would be the, the jurors or it, the, the defendants the, the witnesses and witnesses. Defend, right, right yes. witnesses yeah. and defendants. Um, I think they have a valid perspective and it would be really interesting to hear from their point of view whether they're satisfied with the services they get from interpreters, what their expectations would be and that kind of thing. But I don't know how you would reach that population. Uh, especially with Spanish speakers in this country, many of them are undocumented, they don't want to talk to anyone. Um, if you went into the prisons, 
I don't think you would find people who are very happy with their court experience, <laughs> okay. even if the interpreting was brilliant. So right. I think it would be difficult in practice to do the research, but I think that would be a really interesting avenue to pursue. Is there a problem with legal language, with people not understanding the basic discourse of the court? Yes, a huge problem. Um, I recently read a study by Jemina Napier in, in Australia mm -hmm. And she quoted some research that had been done in the United States among jurors, English-speaking jurors. Did they understand the instructions they were given by the judge? Did they understand the evidence? Did they understand what really happened in the trial? And apparently many of them didn't. Um, so I don't think the legal profession really understands how difficult it is for lay people to understand their language as court interpreters, we always simply say we're putting the Spanish speaker on an equal footing with the English speaker. Many, many U.S. born people go to court, have no idea what happened. And so they, in an equal state of ignorance. Yes, like they are thing. in an equal state of ignorance, unfortunately. Um, so in a way, that can make our job easier because we don't have to worry about whether they understand as long as we convey the message at the right register. So I've had to learn Spanish legalese so that I can turn English legalese into Spanish legalese. But for many, many witnesses and defendants, it doesn't make any difference. I could be reciting the alphabet and they wouldn't. Is that an ethical problem more than a research problem? That in itself, yes. I think that's something for our legal system yeah. to analyze. Um, and it applies across the board. It's not just a language barrier. It's a social class barrier or um, the, just the, the legal profession is too arcane for the rest of the world, I think. Are there any other aspects that you think we should be doing research on with respect to court interpreting? Well, I would like to see more research like what Sandra Hale and Susan Burke Seligson did as far as the impact of the the interpreted testimony on decision makers, mm -hmm. judges and jurors. And I think that part of the problem is that there are so few people doing research and it's so hard to get research grants. When someone submits a proposal for research, they want to do something groundbreaking. They don't try to replicate previous studies. And at the end of every study I've read, they've said, we need more data, we need to replicate this, this is such a small sample, or this is such a limited experience that we don't know how much we can draw conclusions mm -hmm. from this, and no one ever replicates them. So I would like to see just more of the same, really. You've mentioned research done in the United States, in Sandra Hale at University of Western Sydney, Jemina Napier at Macquarie in Australia. Mm -hmm. Are there other countries involved as well, or is it? There are now, I think. I'm seeing, there's just a proliferation of journals of research on interpreting and translating and in general and because court interpreting is growing in more and more countries. Um, Koreans are beginning to look at research mm -hmm. in court proceedings, the Japanese are, especially as they introduce adversarial proceedings right. in their legal systems, they begin to look at the impact of interpreters on that process right. and they have more foreigners, there's more globalization, so they need interpreters more and I think there's um, a lot more attention being paid now. How about your own current work? What, what are you working on in the way well, of books and publications? Um, I write a lot of chapters for books that people mm -hmm. ask me. Fortunately, I never have to submit a proposal. People come to me and say, would you please write an article or a chapter, which is nice. Um, but I am finishing up this revised textbook and I'm working on a translation also just pro bono um, of Jesus Baigorri's book on the history right. of court and Good. of conference interpreting. Into English. Into English, yeah. yeah. This is excellent stuff. Isn't yeah. It? yeah, yeah, it's fascinating yeah. to read. Yeah. Um, and I am writing other articles about, uh, th my work tends to be about, uh, it's not empirical research at all. It's more the, a review of the literature or philosophical in nature, um, writing about the role of interpreters in different situations and attitudes and what should be done and that kind of thing. Good. Okay, we look forward to reading you. Thank you Thank very you. much.